drinking because the episode has has <laughs> has started indeed so yeah mm. cheers everybody i cheers, everyone uh, it's I been a week i've had a long long week Mm -hmm. it's it's what they call dead week at berkeley which is basically the week before finals uh where you don't have any classes all you do is review recitate and like rest i think that's what rr week stands for or something um but I, i'm teaching an economic history class and a lot of students have a lot of questions about all things economic history and it's like whoa okay <laughs> yeah so i yeah, it's I, just I, I need this it's it's just so much like there's so many deadlines in the next week like like six or seven days and it's just crazy so everybody thought like oh let's get it all done before the end of the semester it's like no <laughs> let's not do that my favorite thing is uh sometime around like you know february uh, a bunch of people um it, who were my friends and stuff were like warning me they were like pandemic burnout is on its way varsha you know be ready for it and i was like that's not a thing for me i'll be fine no like first week of May, I was like, kill me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're actually having a uh, seminar about, it's called Burnout and it's about dealing with that. And it's, yeah, it's like next week at my at my university. Yeah. More <laughs> webinars about mindfulness, more things you have to do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, universities. Yeah. They're well-meaning, but you know, oftentimes not so great, so. Um, well, anyway, I think we should probably get going since um, we, we have our guests and we'll, we'll start to ask some questions and we want to um, leave some time for um, more drinking, but also talking, I guess. <laughs> um, so welcome everybody to, to Drinking with Historians and um, uh, we are so delighted to have our, 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 our guest, uh, Dr. Roxanne uh, Panchazi, who's an associate professor of history at Simon Fraser uh, University has a wonderful new book. I'm going to read it because I'm going to forget some of the, the subtitle words. The Future Tense, The Culture of Anticipation in France Between the Wars, is also working on projects related to nuclear testing, the French colonial project in Algeria, and all sorts of other interesting stuff. I hope we can work in some Godzilla questions later on. <laughs> I What's just going on there? It, so, yeah. <laughs> well, perfect. Excellent. <laughs> Save that for later. So, but the first question that we have to ask everybody is, what are you drinking? So, Roxanne, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking uh, a beautiful rosé from France, uh, from the Loire uh, Valley, and uh, it's called, here, I'll hold up the bottle, it's called Virginie Rosé, and it's from, it's a 2018, and I'm so delighted. It's after 4 p.m. today, it's been a really <laughs> long week, and I have turned in my grades, and so <laughs> the bottle and I are going to hang out. <laughs> Yay! <Excellent. laughs> Yeah, I, I have the same feeling. I couldn't find, I, I, went, I went to the whiskey, I went to the nearest whiskey store to see if I could find this bottle of whiskey that's made in France called Pastille. And it's what it's one of my favorite French whiskeys. I mean, it's the only French whiskey I've had, but it's really, really good, but I couldn't find it. So instead I'm drinking uh, Balvenie 12 year because it's my favorite scotch or one of my favorite scotches. Nice. And Matt has a fancy cocktail, I'm sure. Oh yeah. I do have a, I do have a fancy cocktail. So, but let's ask Rachel first what she's drinking. I'm almost done a dogfish. <laughs> I'm sorry, a fly, a flying fish. It's Friday. It's a flying fish farmhouse, and it was really good, and I really needed it. <laughs> I think I think that that's true for everybody. I mean, like it is a Friday. It is the end of the semester. It is it is time to to have a drink and and have a good conversation. So, um, so so th thank you, Rachel. Rachel will um, be beh behind the scenes uh, taking your questions. Um, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll get to them in the second half. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so while she disappears, yes, I have a fancy um, uh, cocktail. Um, it is called a French Manhattan. Um, I, took, I, put, I put a picture of the, the recipe on, um, on Twitter if you want to take a look at it. It's, it's cognac, it's sweet vermouth, it's a little bit of Pointreau and then some Angostura bitters and then a, a fancy cherry as well. Um, and it's from this, this great uh, cocktail book by uh, David Libovitz, who I was knew with, that we had Rex, Roxanne on. I knew she was going to be drinking French wine, and it made me think of the archives in Paris and sitting in cafes. And so I wanted to do something a little bit lovely, and it is, it is indeed lovely. Um, the, the, the scenery, looking at you guys, is, is amazing, but you know, it's not the same as, as being in Paris, seeing the streetscapes and stuff like that. So, so we can... We can um, you know, fantasize about that. So cheers, everyone, and welcome to Drinking with Historians. Cheers. 
So I I would like to ask the first question because I've, I've told this story a couple of times. Uh, the reason I got into history goes back to ninth grade when I was learning about the French Revolution. And I thought that my teacher was telling the truth when he said, you know, when Louis XVI is executed, people could feel his blood spatter on their faces. And I thought that was amazing. And so like the next like almost eight to nine years of my life, I was like obsessed with the French Revolution. I've read way too many books on it. I, I was really into it. But why did you get into French history, Roxanne? Was it also the French Revolution or no? No, I got into French history because I grew up in Montreal. Um, oh. And uh, so when I applied to graduate school, I wasn't really into Canadian history. <laughs> um, when you go to school and do history in Canada, you study a lot of British history for some obvious reasons. And um, I really didn't think I was going to grad school in the US and like I had not really done that much US history and the idea of like me sort of showing up and being a US historian didn't make any kind of sense. And I had French as a language and there was no way I was going to yet, I tried later, learn German. So <laughs> it was kind of an accident, I'd never been to France. I didn't go to France until I went to do my dissertation research, until after my exams, until after I defended my proposal, I had never been to France. Wow. I'm one of those people. <laughs> I don't know how many of us there are, but I'd never gone to France. So I was in my fourth year, I guess, or third or fourth year of my PhD program before I went yeah. to France for the first time. Well, you're lucky. I still have not been to France uh, oh. because, yeah, I've only been to two European countries. I've been to London or England, and I've been to Vienna for like three days. Nice. My dream is to go to France, but I've not been to France yet. Well, maybe we can time it because I don't get to go very often, but um, yeah. I do love it. Uh, and I and yeah. I fell in love and then became a total francophile, but it wasn't something I was in love with French history before I'd ever mm -hmm. gone there. So. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, that, that's that's oftentimes been a common element when we ask this question of of some of our other guests is is just you know they stumble into periods sometimes like it's sometimes for me like it was just I had a great teacher as an undergraduate like I had no affinity for medieval studies when I started you know, um, school or anything like that, but I had a great teacher who I just wanted to do that. Other people have kind of connections to this in some fundamental ways, like a heritage connection or, yeah. and it's just, it's just a variety of different ways. And there's no one set way that, you know, somebody becomes um, kind of a subject specialist, is there? No, I always assume that medievalists, I, I always think it's the name of the rose. Like the name of the rose. <laughs> want to be a medievalist which is maybe a terrible like do you all like maybe you get sick of people talking about the name of the rose Matt you know I mean you know I would, I would take the name of the rose on a, uh, after another Monty Python reference as much <laughs> as I love Monty Python um, sure. you know having somebody have seen having seen that that classic Sean Connery um, Christian Slater film um, F. Murray Abraham as the Inquisitor. Like, um, okay, this is now a Name of the Rose podcast. So we're just going to talk about that. I would come hour. on that podcast. So, yes. I read the book, I watched the film. So, so, so you went to, so you, you, you kind of, you know, stumbled into this, you, you went to France, you kind of fell in love with this. So how did you select like the topic of your work, like thinking about kind of the interwar um, period specifically? Um, so I should just say the book is, it's old now. It's, um, how old is sure. it? <laughs> Do I even want to admit how old it is? I'm still working on my second book. It's taken me a while. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, I chose the topic of that book, but the topic of that book is the future. And so the topic of that book is actually multiple topics. There's mm. a chapter on the history of Paris. There's a chapter on Esperanto. There's a chapter on military planning and the Maginot Line. There's a chapter on French representations of America. So it's really kind of all over the place. And I would say that that is probably, the book is symptomatic of me as a historian in general. I can never pick. And I still have trouble picking uh, what I'm working on. And I'm usually working on two or three different things in different time periods that have nothing to do with each other. It's a real problem. Yeah. Go ahead, Varsha. Oh, I, I was just saying, I totally understand that. I think when I took French history, I took a couple of French history classes um, after the one I took on the actual revolution. And when you get to the 20th century, it's sort of a chaotic century for France. Like a lot of things are, are going on. Um, so I guess my question is, how did you decide on, on the future as like the major category of analysis for the book, even though there's like a lot of different topics? Like what do you get from studying the future? Yeah, so with that book, um, I, um, I went to France to do a dissertation on the Maginot Line. 
I was going to do a social and cultural history of the Maginot Line that, um, and because I'm, I've, I've always been interested in, and I'm still a historian who, I'm a culture historian, but I often work on military topics in a way that maybe some military historians haven't really tackled. So there's a huge amount of work for me to do because the way that traditional military history, and this was, you know, more true in 1996 when I started that project than it certainly is now. I mean, the, what the people who work on military topics, the range of those people and their methodologies and their approaches, it's just like totally different from in the early 90s when I was starting to think about this. So I was going to go work on the Maginot Line because I'd gotten interested in fortification and I'd already done some work on World War One and the trenches and um, soldiers and prosthetic limbs and amputation and some of those kinds of things. And I went to France. I spent a year actually working on that dissertation. And by the end of it, I kind of stumbled. And this was like, <laughs> the internet existed, but like Google searching didn't exist. And so sometimes you would- Some of us are old enough to remember that. Yes, right? Um, There's dial up and the bing, bing, bing sound. <laughs> like all yep. of that. And so um, I started working on this and then I actually found a French dissertation that um, it was kind of a disastrous story that turned out really well in the end where I found a French dissertation that sort of that I hadn't known about before going um, that was not, like I read on microfiche or something at the at the old National Library the BN and I it kind of went through a lot of the kinds of evidence that I was looking for and I'm not gonna lie I think a, a wonderful and there there is um, someone working on it uh, uh, what I'm sure will be an amazing book on the Maginot Line now but uh, Kevin Passmore, but I read this dissertation and I, it bored me. <laughs> I'm not going to say <laughs> I got sick of it. And I, but I also had just felt like the topic wasn't really me, you know, yeah. but I was doing it. I was in it. I'd committed to it. And so I decided to totally change gears and that uh, specific topic became the subject of one chapter the prosthetic stuff that I'd written um, about masculinity and uh, the body and technology became another chapter. And then I just decided to sort of turn it into this other thing, which became much more unwieldy, uh, much more like so difficult to pin down. And this was before I would say at the time, it was a weird thing to be doing working on the future. Like now, um, anticipation and the future are very popular topics. Um, and in the last, you know, 10 years since my book came out, I've heard a lot about like, oh, the future's hot now. And I'm like, well, that's great. I wish it had been hot when I was <laughs> I basically had very few people to talk to. So I ended up kind of communicating with people who work on the different sort of chapter areas. Like, so I went to conferences about urban history and I went to conferences about military history and I went to conferences about international relations and diplomacy when I was working on the Esperanto stuff. And that was really great, but also pretty challenging because I, but again, over the course of my career, it's like I'm a professional dilettante, like I'm always doing that. And I can't really complain about it because I definitely choose it over and over again. Well, I mean, there, there's an, an immense amount of freedom, right? And being able to choose kind of just things that are, that are of interest to you and, and having these thematic interests rather than a specific chronological or topical interest allows you to kind of do those things. Um, you know, this, this idea, I was going to say, I mean, like when you were working on this project, like Kaselik, for example, was not like a thing. Like he was not like a guy that people knew about. Like he had written in German, but like, oh my God, yeah. it's in German. Like people didn't pay attention to that. Yeah, the translation of that. Kaselik. Everybody he's like, super hot. Like everybody I reads. Know. You know. Kaselik, and I was like trying to struggle with it. And I met a midi like a colleague of mine who's medievalist who was like, oh, Kaselik. Um, so I think the medievalists knew before maybe some others that Hasselic was the one to watch. <laughs> That's why the name of the rose is so amazing. So <laughs> it's, it's, it was all in the, it was all in the medieval manuscripts that were burned up in the monastery and the, the Italian Alps, and we would have known about this this much you know, a long time ago, for for that evil Bernard Guy. Um, <laughs> but so your your topics of you know your your focus right now, like the project that you're working on right now, has kind of moved a little bit further. Not. I was going to say into the future, but um, into into <laughs> that topic's future, right? Into a, a little bit more contemporary post World War II um, era, specifically dealing with colonial issues, with um, uh, the issues of, of nuclear power, nuclear testing, nuclear war, and nuclear weapons, yeah. and things like that. So, what kind of led you? What kind of led you to that? You know, I, I'm going to say it's 
say teaching did, because mm. uh, I think, um, I mean, I don't know about everybody else out there. I don't know about you, Varsha, and you, Matt, but like, there was training and there was doing this PhD and then there was teaching like a French history survey <laughs> every year or every other year or whatever, teaching a seminar on the French Revolution. And that, that not only that totally transformed the, the project that was my dissertation, you know, mm -hmm. became a manuscript then became a book. Like I have so much gratitude for those courses that I taught and students, cause it gave me this kind of bigger picture that I sort of had, but I'd never even taken like a French history survey as an undergrad and I didn't really do one in graduate school either. I just mm. kind of started doing this research. And so teaching it really gave me that view of like, and I only teach from the revolution. So a couple of decades before, you know, I, a little bit, bit further into the 18th century, please don't ask me about anything. <laughs> this is my great fear that I was gonna have to talk about things before the 18th century. And then teaching it and thinking about issues. And also, I guess the project on the future really came out of like grad school seminars and reading for exams sure. and those kinds of things and less out of politics for me. And I think teaching, trying to connect modern French history teaching where I live. So on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh peoples known as Vancouver, trying to connect my students to this place, France, mm -hmm. um, that many of them had never been to, might not go to. Uh, I, I found myself reaching more and more for like those political connections, trying to get them to think about why it's useful and worthwhile to think about France in the present, why French history might have something to do with this place where we live. Colonialism and imperialism became one oh. way to do that. And then the field, also totally transformed in part because of some of the amazing people I went to graduate school with who like worked on these topics and worked on empire and drew attention to the history of France and Algeria and other parts of the French empire. And I went to school at a time when that was really kind of separate. It was like there were the empire people and the people who worked on other aspects of French history. And now I would say that the field, like if you don't work on empire or address empire, like you're doing something wrong. Like you need that to be a part of your work. So those things kind of all came yeah. together. And I wanted to do something that had like a real, I could really feel the politics of it and the significance of that politics. And it's not that the earlier project wasn't political or didn't have political implications. It's just, that's not where it came from. And so this one feels a lot more like me um, mm. I'm invested in a very different way. I can feel a lot more directly the impact of studying bombs and French, you know, nuclear detonations in the Algerian Sahara. Now people are talking about it more in 2021. So all of that makes me feel like I'm doing a project that's alive in a different way than my mm. dissertation project felt at the time, if that makes sense. I, I have a question sort of building on that. Um, when I took four semesters of French, three in college, one in graduate school. And you always have these cultural lessons, right? Where like, you know, the French teacher gets really into like French film. And even when you take a French history class, you learn that like, you know, the French are just really into their history. And so <laughs> since you're like, and, and that makes a lot of sense, mainly because, you know, French history, especially uh, especially anything that's happening in the late 19th century, uh, late 18th century onto like most of the 19th century is like world changing. Right, France hasn't really become. I'm not going to say it's irrelevant, but like people don't really start thinking French, the French, as irrelevant until after World War II. Right, by by people, I mean Americans. So how, based on like the research that you're doing now, like how do you think it sort of fits with what if if you've been to France recently or if you know a little bit about it, like how the French are sort of considering their history? Because I mean, there's a big conversation in the U.S. right now about critical race theory and what should we be teaching about American history? Um, and this is a conversation that's going on in a bunch of different countries, in the UK and in oh. India and Japan. So I was just wondering, you know, because the French are so obsessed with like being French, how does, you know, studies like, how does bringing up things like decolonization and Algeria sort of play in France? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm definitely new to this territory working on this new project. And there are definitely lots of historians and other scholars who've been doing this work that I'm kind of building on. So I wanna make sure to, to be clear about that. But yeah, right now is a moment when that reckoning with the question of empire intersects with so many things. And I mean, I'm just thinking, 
you know, this past week, we were talking about the week we all had. While I was having my week with my grading and all that other stuff, I was also noticing the passage of um, this anniversary of Napoleon's death. And that's just like a yeah. really good example, right? Of something that um, has produced a great amount of conflict for very good reasons. Um, and that is being commemorated in this way uh, that there's a lot of debate about that the historians and other people who I know have drawn attention to like the history of slavery most saliently, right? But other things as well about Napoleon's, the period of the Napoleonic empire and about Napoleon's legacy. Um, that's a really good example. And it's also a way that I can kind of connect like with my students too, right? To bring these things up and say, yeah, this is something that people are arguing about. And it doesn't just connect to that history from the 18th or 19th century. It's about those legacies and how they played out and how they lead to things like the way that um, the memory of these, this colonial period, this imperial period has shaken out the way that race and questions of immigration and other things um, get talked about in France. So it's all really connected. And that's just one, I think this week, the most maybe spectacular example of attention around that question. And it's always happening every week. And as far as the, you know, critical race theory conversations in the US context, like, of course, there's this ongoing thing uh, right now, especially really intensely about um, this Islamo-Gauchisme, right? The idea of this kind of convergence yeah. of uh, like a certain kind of attention to race and the idea that it's sort of come from America. <laughs> it's, it's America's fault that this is, it's these theories. So it's not just America. We love to blame us. About critical race theory being the problem. It's also French people kind of making the argument that, that all of these theories came from the United States, but they did not, absolutely. And, you know, having these conversations about the left, having these conversations and just debates about the status of how we talk about Islam in France, like all of these things kind of coming together. And my project isn't, straight on, like straight ahead about those things, but I definitely feel like all of those conversations are a part of how I need to think about what I'm doing and the impact it might have if I'm trying to have conversations with people. Yeah, yeah, it, it seems like, I mean, that, that seems to be a common theme within this, within European American kind of political culture right now is, is, is the fact that we're actually confront, well, not, not really, but maybe that we're starting to confront this legacy of empire. Right. And yeah. what that actually means, like with with all the things that are tied up to it, the legacy of colonialism and racism and exploitation and things like that. And there's there's very maybe not, but maybe a very understandably a reaction to that and unwillingness to accept that the, the culpability of the nation and the peoples who are within it for these types of things. And you, I think, you know, in the U.S., it's pushed back against like the 1619 Project, critical race theory in the U.K., again, ongoing conversations about Churchill and you know, British Empire and, and things like that. And then, like you said, like the Islamic leftism, um, you know, kind of debate, it seems these things seem all kind of wrapped up. And, you know, your your new project, like with the Algerian experience, right, in the French Sahara, like it's it seems kind of tied into that. Um, I did actually want to segue into a slightly different topic, though, because I, I'm wondering, too, like, um, you know, as you are kind of, since you did kind of the future before the future was hot, you are a prophet and you heard that here first, right? <laughs> um, a historical prophet. Um, like, I'm wondering too, like, does, does, your, does, your, does your work kind of engage in, in environmental history as well? Like, or are you kind of thinking in that way? Yeah, I mean, I need to, right? Um, I am thinking more and more in that way. This project too, though, is at the intersection of these different historiographies. I mean, like every project, right? But sure. I definitely feel like I'm doing, you know, nuclear weapons, bombs, colonialism and empire, so nuclear imperialism, but then obviously the environmental impact. So recently I've been very obsessed with these, well, it's not just me that's been obsessed with this, but these dust storms that are been coming out of the Sahara and spreading around the world, which happens every year, like millions of tons of sand from the Sahara fly around the world every year. But this year, those storms really hit France in particular quite hard and well Europe other countries in Europe but especially France and so there's been this commentary and the sand is radioactive and the radioactivity can be traced back to these atmospheric tests in the early 1960s that I write about so 1960 in 2021 like that those connections that past present thing that I was talking about it's definitely alive in some terrible ways in my work but there's been this um, discussion of these storms. So there've been like five major ones, you know, wind shields, 
uh, ski resorts, uh, the skies turn orange and different shades of yellow in parts of France and other places too. But in France, the significance has seemed more, you know, people have said that it's karma, that the empire is coming back to uh, haunt the French because of these tests that were conducted. And of course, that's an environmental concern. And then the stuff that the French ditched, they took what they needed and wanted when they left those nuclear testing sites, testing sites, bomb detonation sites in the Sahara, and then they buried the rest of it in the desert. And so one of the many contentious issues between the Algerian state in the contemporary context and the French state is like, we need clear indications of where this stuff is. Um, it's buried, it, France needs to clean this stuff up. It's France's responsibility to do that. And so of course, all of that you know, begs the question of environmental catastrophe, disaster, the implications for the Algerian population over decades and the environmental cost of all of this. Am I allowed to pour more in my glass or is that yes. like- <laughs> Yes, definitely, I'm definitely. Like, well, yes, I do are. that without seeming definitely. like I have a problem. <laughs> La last time we had an interview, somebody commented, Varsha, I'm LOLing at how many times you're pouring in. And I'm like, you shouldn't be LOLing. You should also be pouring That's right. Right. as well. Okay. Um, exactly. Uh, okay, so I would like to focus on this uh, question of like, France loving to blame the US because when you're talking about <laughs> nuclear stuff, uh, one thing that I've researched sort of came up in my memory is this thing called like the multilateral force. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's basically in the 1960s, the US was like, okay, every a lot of NATO countries were pissed at, uh, at the US for having all this control over nuclear weapons, uh, especially France. And so uh, the US was like, okay, why don't we start arming, you know, we, we create this joint task force where all of us are armed and like Germany will be armed too. And France was like, excuse me, excuse me. And like, that was in the 1960s. And that began a long passage of uh, anti-American sentiment in France. And so I guess my question is how does anti-Americanism sort of play into France's interest in nuclear weapons in the 1960s and 70s? Well, I mean, and, and this is kind of an interesting thing for me, because when I started on this project to do with nuclear weapons and bombs, I thought I was really like, the future is over. I'm done with that. I don't want to talk about that book anymore. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm going to do something totally different for me. And then, you know, a couple of people along the way sort of were like, excuse me, <laughs> Roxanne, you're still talking about like a future war. You're still talking about people anticipating things. And of course, it's not a totally different project. Some of the same issues are there. And I don't know a lot about the multilateral force, like that's not an area that I have particular expertise in, but it is definitely the case that the way that weapons get talked about and the way that the French acquiring the bomb gets talked about is part of a very long history. And I have a chapter about it in that first book. I call it the first book because I, I, I hope and pray that the second book. <laughs> I was at a conference once and one of the scholars there was like, I haven't finished my second book. So is it a lie to call the first book the first book? Maybe it's just the book. <laughs> So <laughs> the, book, the first book, when you start calling it the first book, I feel like it's a moment of confidence, you know? So I'm like, the first book, there's a chapter on this very long history that goes back even further than I talk about it of a kind of anti-American sentiment and anxiety about the United States, an economic anxiety, a political one, a cultural, like a fear of cultural imperialism. And, you know, I make the argument in that, if I can remember it, because I didn't reread it for today. <laughs> there is this kind of perpetual thing about France, culturally at least, sliding into becoming America all the time. It's just all the fear of becoming American is there. When it comes to the weapons and the bombs that I'm talking about, that military, post-45, that military anxiety of, especially when it comes to weapons, not being a part of an atomic club, of being bossed around by the United States, by the Soviet Union to a lesser extent, by the UK, like that idea that France needs to assert itself, the French, de Gaulle in particular, needs to assert himself um, in this global kind of balance of power, which we talk about before 1945, but it really, come, and so the France acquiring the bomb in this period is like part of that for sure. I think that that's super important. And then, yeah, the question about Germany is there. And then that sort of shifts as we start talking about Europe in a different way, right? That it's Europe against uh, North America or against the Anglo powers or against the non-European powers. So those kinds of things are always moving, but the anti-American thread is there since at least the 18th century, I would say. Um, and then it just kind of grows, intensifies in the 19th century. It's super intense after the First World War. And then after the Second World War, it's like, 
we're done. How do we assert ourselves now? So all those yeah. questions of like NATO and you know uh, the French resisting again, like mm. calling up the spirit of the French resistance in order to resist that kind of American dominance in the world. I think is like across the board, political, cultural, all of those things. So you mentioned De Gaulle. And so when I think of like French history, I think of like, you know, a few like famous people like pop into my head. There's uh, Robespierre, there's Napoleon, there's Marie Antoinette. And then even though my 20th century French history is not great, there's like De Gaulle. He is like this huge figure in, in French history. Why is he so like, <laughs> why is he so polarizing? Is he like a Margaret Thatcher type character? Or is he like, is he somebody who's actually revered in France? I. I can't fully yes. get a handle on him. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> yes. I mean, he's 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 big, y'all. <laughs> like he's, you know, I mean, I feel like you probably would have like I don't remember if Napoleon was in your list, Farsha, but like in yeah. terms of that kind of debate and tension and defining or being the first thing that people think about when they think about a place, not just internally, but on the outside. I'm always making this joke and I'm not drinking my wine out of it today. I thought about doing it. I'm actually drinking my wine out of French glass, a Jurelex glass, um, but I was gonna drink it out of a mug that shout out to my honor students from last year that they gave me that says, don't ask me about Napoleon on it. Cause I've been drinking out of it every day this week. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause I say it all the time because as a historian of France and I know I'm not alone um, there is a thing that happens when I say I work on France, like at a party, let's say, and it's sometimes like, it's often a dude. It's sometimes someone's like, dad. Was Napoleon really short? Did he like really he cross all of Russia? talk to me or talk at me about Napoleon. <laughs> it's just a thing. And I know some things about Napoleon. I teach, you know, in the survey, I talk about it. I'm going to teach the revolution. But I'm not like a Napoleon scholar, but it's something I think I read somewhere that the Civil War and Napoleon are the top two topics that there are the most magazines and like fan stuff and reenactments. I know you hear something you work on that like Napoleon is it and I would say for the 20th century that's de Gaulle like that kind of towering figure literally like the obsession around how tall he was, but also the the, the person who seems to incarnate the French Republic, the nation state, the empire for a period of time, and who remains like this touchstone politically, that people are constantly, and subsequent political leaders are always trying to like establish their cred in relationship to de Gaulle, even though there's an ambivalence about him, like he's just there all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I think if, if it's okay, I mean, we have some some great questions in the Q&A, and so we want to we transition into the second half of the, the the, the sure. show where we ask those. So uh, Mary has a great one. Um, and, and this goes back to kind of um, your, your conversation about being kind of interested in lots of different things is, is she wanted to ask you about your podcast. And so like, she loves your podcast. And she says she wanted to know, like, how is reading so much and speaking to so many different types of people kind of shaped your research and teaching? Like, do you see that kind of an extension? Has it changed anything in, in how you kind of think about the past? Yes, totally. The podcast, and I, and, you know, I've like written a tiny bit about this here and there for like a blog and stuff that I started the podcast. I'm coming up on my eighth anniversary for the podcast. I started in 2013. So it's been eight. So again, it's like, I'm always doing these things that are like super nerdy and out there. And then they like, I mean, literally who doesn't, who hasn't in this year of pandemic like everyone's a podcaster now, right? We all are, all teachers, everybody. <laughs> but I started doing this. We're, we're webcasters, Roxanne. Oh, right. That's right. We're not a right. This is not a podcast. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm so impressed by that because you're not afraid of like the image and the video. Like I record, <laughs> and I tell people this, it's not a secret. I record in my kitchen, in my bedroom, in my living room, in my pajamas, because I can do whatever I want. No hairdos is my motto for the because it's all just audio. We don't look at each other. And many times there are guests who I've never actually met in person or seen their faces or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I started it about eight years ago and I started it in part because as a single mom of a really little kid and I couldn't go to France anymore. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go to conferences. I couldn't, I couldn't. So, but I felt like I wanted to try to connect with my professional life again and my field. And that was a really great way to do it. I could, at the time, Skype, does anybody even use Skype anymore? What is Skype now? Um, so I could Skype with people, talk to them, and I learned so much. And then over time, 
you know, when I started it, I was very far away from being able to imagine my second book. My head was just like on another planet. And over time, just reading other people's books, asking questions about how their projects developed, even things that had nothing to do with the time period or the topics or thematics that I work on has been tremendously helpful. Like it changes the way I think. People make kinds of arguments that I think, oh, okay, that's not about what I work on, but I could think about it this way. And it's just taught me, again, like the teaching did, it's taught me so much about different topics and areas in French history. And I feel like my own specific area that I research has been so enriched by all, every single one of those conversations. The shout out to the early modernists and the people who work on before the early modern period. I can never get enough of them to talk to me. I think they think I'm like a 20th century person. Um, Cause I really learned so much from people working across those fields, time periods, topics. It's amazing, amazing. That's great. Um, so we have a question uh, from Sarah. She says, hi, Roxanne. This is from a colleague, Sarah at SFU. Uh, so she asks you, um, you know, in your upcoming work on nuclear testing, could you talk a little bit more about how Algerians thought about and, and spoke about nuclear testing and how it differed from French understandings of the same? You know, were there different ways of knowing or experiencing or, um, or productive for historical thinking to sort of like, you know, compare and contrast between Algeria and France? Yeah, I mean, I think since the bombs um, have been detonated, were detonated in the early 60s, and then um, since the French left, since Algerian independence, the coverage of those two things and the approaches to those things, and right up to the present, the way the two countries deal with that past and what they both want. <laughs> I mean, at some basic level, it's like Algerians want disclosure and uh, compensation and recognition and apology. Not all Algerians perhaps, but the state and certainly the victims of testing um, and these bomb detonations and of the radiation that ensued. So there's that obvious divide. In the period of the detonations themselves, that is a way harder thing to access. Um, not so much in terms of language, because I can, you know, a lot of that stuff would, you know, is available to me, but just in terms of the populations who were the victims of testing and of these detonations, they, um, you know, the kinds of records that we're talking about in terms of being able to connect with those people, it's like that's much more oral testimonies, oral histories, and definitely a type of work that I, uh, really important people are doing right now, especially the people who are arguing for compensation, but it's not so much what I work on. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a huge divide in the experience of what were essentially like bombs being dropped in the desert and all of the effects of that. So one of the arguments that was made, not just by Algerians, but by others in North Africa, there were arguments made about how these bombs, if the sand, <laughs> if the sand is radioactive and ending up in France in, 19, in 2021 from 1960, then in 1960 and in 1958, 59, there was a huge amount of protest from other North African states. I write a little bit about the UN debates about the Saharan um, for de first detonations in 1960, but those debates started in 58, 59, that, uh, you know, like testified and, and sort of bore witness to the fact that political boundaries don't make any difference when you're talking about an atmospheric, like a nuclear detonation that leads to fallout and radiation. That spills over into Morocco, Tunisia, like these other places. And so I think it's like, what did Algerians experience? What did Africans experience? And how did they understand this as like yet another act of colonialism? So starting in the 1950s, all the way up to the present, I'm looking at that divide between colonized peoples, um, the people of empire, and then the imperial power, for sure. So um, switching, switching gears a little bit is, um, uh, Kara has a, a great question. So do you have any good stories, the times that you have gone to France and been able to work in the archives, any good French archive stories? And for those of you who aren't aware, like everybody has a French archive story who has worked oh, yeah. in a French archive. So I was, you know, I was thinking about this because I thought it might come up and I was thinking about it. So, you know, if you're a French historian, old BN, new BN means something to you yep. if you're of a certain age. <laughs> um, so for the younger people, the graduate students these days, maybe old BN, new BN is like, so Bibliothèque Nationale, National Library. 
So Matt knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. The old National Library, which still exists, right? And has like manuscripts and other collections there. I don't know if you still get to work there, Matt, more. Yeah, that's where the old, that's where the old timey stuff is. That's so right. So they've gone that up. And then Nubian, which is in a different part of town. And the, you know, we could all, we could have like a, a whole podcast about people's ideas about that library and how they've argued about it over the years. Yeah. Um, so I started out 1996, seven is the first time I went to France to do research. So old BN and there's like, and it was also first time in France, right? And it wasn't France in 2021. It was like going to a different planet. Like <laughs> things were so different and yeah. you couldn't like, I was learning so much about the right things to do, the wrong things to do, like a lot of the wrong things to do. And then these kind of cultural quirks, which I say, I would say have changed over time, but there's a lot more, like you can get a lot of burgers and bagels in Paris today. Yes. And you could not, you can get to go coffee in yeah. Paris today. That was not <laughs> like that thing that no. you could do. You could get coffee in a plastic cup that spilled out of a vending machine, but it didn't come with a lid. And you could like go to McDonald's or Quick or one of those places and get something, but not a French place wouldn't give you coffee to go. Like that was not mm. a thing in the night. So, <laughs> Toilets. <laughs> <laughs> so the old BN, the first time I go to the old BN, there were many disasters that befell me that day. There was the, the, we, I don't know how much you all know about the fact that there's like French technology. It's just French technology. It's like mini <laughs> things that don't exist. They had these barcode cards. It was like a little piece of cardboard and it was like like laminated, like from a, like it was pretty DIY, like lamination, these cards. Yeah. I get one, I figure it out, I show my credentials, I've got my letter that says all the things it's supposed to say, I get my credentials and I get this card. And I have no idea what I'm doing. And the room is like, I mean, I love the New York Public Library. I'd spent a lot of time there. That's kind of hallowed and cool and whatever. But I mean, it's next level at the old BN in the yeah. old environment. Go in there and there's like a, literally a president of the room over there. And you have to like, yeah. oh. I put my card in one of these machines. I'm going to get to the toilets. I put my card in one of these machines. <laughs> and I don't know. I left it there. So I had to go like to the, the, the desk. Like I, I can sort of, if I see it cinematically in my head, there's like a, I like a, a fisheye lens and it's like, I'm yeah. going <laughs> and really like I'm the first person in the history of the library to lose my card. And I they don't really know where I'm <laughs> from because my French is pretty good, but it's not perfect. So it's kind of got an accent, but I don't know, I'm brown, so they're not sure if I'm American or not. Like it's confusing who I am. And so that happens. Then at some point during that same day, I need to go to the washroom. So I go. I walk into the washroom and again I'm still learning France like I think this was probably like a few days after I got to Paris for the first time in my life and I open one of the stalls and there is a toilet there and there's no seat and I'm like oh this one's effed I'll go to the next one and there's no seat, <laughs> there's no seat. like all of them are like that because not always, and I don't want to say all French toilets are like this. I feel like there are French historians who are listening to this. Who's like, what a terrible representation! Of this. <laughs> <laughs> there is a different toilet, public toilet culture in France, yep. maybe in every country. And it just now, when I think about that, like by the time I got to the third one, I was like, dude, it's not them. It's you, like. <laughs> 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 the Turkish, one, you know, the ones that they call Turkish or whatever. Yeah. Like, that's like a big deal. Like, and I am a little bit, I mean, the pandemic has changed things. So I feel now, now everybody's a germaphobe, but I'm a little bit of a germaphobe. And yeah, the whole scenario, or just like, even now, this is true of every bathroom now where you're like, how does the, how does this work? Or what, why is all this toilet paper pink? That's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> pink and Toilet paper, yeah. really big in France. I don't know if that's still true. My French historians who spend more time there than I get to these days will tell me, but that was a huge thing in the 90s. Yeah. I was like, what is with the pink? Like, I've never actually had pink. Can you buy pink anymore here? There is. So, <laughs> where do we go so from I, there, guys? <laughs> so I have to ask, I've never been to France, but like, it's my dream to go one day. And even though I have, you know, four semesters of French under my belt, my speaking French is horrible. If I actually go there one day and let's say I get to an archive or a library, since it's 2021, do I have to speak French? 
like you did in the 90s or like are they just not gonna are they gonna pretend not to understand me if i speak english may may may, may i tell my archive story <laughs> yeah, now so yes so so it was, it was probably just just after you i think it was 99 um that i went for the first time in um and i didn't go to the bibliotech house you know my i wanted to see like this one manuscript that i was working on for, for the dissertation and because i wanted to see something about how it was bound and, and stuff like that so i actually had to see the manuscript and they had microfilmed it and they gave me the microfilm when i first got there you know i, I did all the things and like like rick was saying you have to have a letter of introduction and you got to do the right thing and ask the right person for the right thing and stuff like that and so it's at the Bibliothèque Mazarin, which is at the, the Collège de France. Right. So it's, it's, it's a slightly different archive, but it's still kind of intimidating. It's just like 18th century grand hall and it's really lovely. And it's actually a delightful place to work. But um, so I get there and I do that. And so I have to go, I know I have to go to the archivist to like, like Roxanne was saying, like there, was like, there was a president of the room, like, and like, it's like an elevated platform off, often. Like the president like of to, the Senate? Like, if yeah, like you have to kind of look up at the person and like ask that them. That sounds dystopian and really weird. French bureaucracy. There you go. Um, <laughs> French archives. So, so I have to do this. So I spend like my, my, my French is like fine, but it's not great. And, you know, I, so I spent half a day just building up the courage. I know I need to do that like immediately, but like it takes me <laughs> half a day to like build up the courage to go do this, right? My, again, my first time in France as well. Jim Appel right? Matthew. That's right. So, and, I, and I, I work out exactly what I'm going to say because I know they're going to say like, why do you need to see the manuscript? You have a microphone, right? So I said, okay, I need to see this and because of the binding and stuff like that. And I, I work it out and I say this and like, it's in kind of broken French. And thankfully, the, the the woman who was there, she was she was a relatively younger woman, like probably just you know not too too much older than than I was at the time, and she she has this like kind of bemused look on her face, like I'm torturing you and I know it, and this is really pleasant to me, and so she fight like I, I get through this whole thing in French, and then she raises her hand and she says, "Stop, you have spoken enough French. I will give you the manuscript." <laughs> I've been to Berlin, like Germany, and I've worked at the like I did some stuff at the Stats Bibliothèque or whatever for mm -hmm. like, something I need to do. And I mean, I in my experience, like French is, French people will let you speak, and my I'm obviously yeah. my French is like a zillion times better than my German, which is just ridiculous. But I remember like the, like in Germany, I had that in Berlin, I had the experience of like people wouldn't even let they would just be like. <laughs> Yeah. Let's just do this in English. It's just easier. Yeah. And it's definitely different. Like every place that where there's another language being spoken, some people get excited that you're trying to speak their language. And I certainly met French people like that who were super encouraging, who taught me like my French. I was just telling some friends this that I, you know, when I went to France, I fell in love and I fell in love with a person. And that is the best way to learn a language, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, the levels. It's like, yeah. and, and like learning another language, once you can tell a joke, you're bilingual, like you can, that's a step on the road to bilingualism. Jokes come pretty quickly for me in any language, like partly because I just sound ridiculous and I'm not afraid to make mistakes. So people are <laughs> laughing all the time when I'm speaking yeah. another language. But for me, it's getting angry. I feel mm. like I was in lots of situations in France, like trying to open a bank account was one of them, like doing some different things where I was like, I'd get angry and then I'd be like, damn it, I don't know how to be angry in this language yet. Dating a French man really helps. <laughs> <laughs> and the real <laughs> advice to historians out there, date yeah. a French man I, if you want to be French. Maybe that's true for uh, people who are operating in other languages too, because I knew <sighs> when we were first together and we'd fight, and he's still one of my very good friends. Um, but he is like was my language teacher and that was he was like in his 20s I was in my 20s and so I often say when I speak French I kind of sound like a 25 year old dude from the 1990s <laughs> <laughs> it's not always great like it's not always okay to talk like that there's a lot of slang and it's like not great yeah. but when we first argue I would switch to English and it's also a lesson that like when you're arguing with somebody, you really just want to hear yourself talk because he didn't understand what I was saying, but I would switch to English because I was like, I really need to sound really good to myself right now. <laughs> but when over time, over the next year, when I would stick to French and then I could really get pissed off in French, I was like, I have arrived now. Now I'm Frank. Now I'm bilingual. I can do this. I can yell at you and tell you everything that's happening in French. <laughs> Oh my God, that makes me feel so much better because I can yell at people in Hindi. Like I can't yell at people in French. 
But like only recently have I been brushing up on my speaking Hindi. Like I can read pretty well, but I've been like watching a lot of like Hindi movies and stuff. And like recently I've been like, I found a way to like yell at people in Hindi. I can insult them in Hindi. And I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, see, I, I have a very different language experience with Hindi than you do, Varsha. Bar- like, Bar- like, I have, my mom has always spoken to us in a kind of English, and we refused. So I can be yelled at in Hindi, <laughs> very <laughs> effectively, but I can only yell back in English. <laughs> That's me with Tamil. So my parents are actually from South India, even though my mom was right. born in North India, right? So my parents, my whole life, since we moved to the United States, but even before that, they have always spoken to me in Tamil, especially in public when they don't want other people to realize they're yeah. yelling at me, right? Money. But I, I will just... only, yeah. So like, if they tell me in public at a store, like this lady in front of me is really rude. Like, you know, I hate her. They'll tell me this in Tamil and I'm like, mom, stop being rude to the lady in front of you. And she'll be like, what is wrong with you? Like, and so I cannot, to, for the life of me, I cannot respond in Tamil. Um, when my grandmother was alive, she grew up in South India. She only spoke Tamil. She never learned a word of English in her life. When she visited us, um, me, my sister, and my brother would try to talk to her because she would be really interested in talking to us. But all we could say is yes and no. That's all we could say. Yeah. Uh, and so, but like we knew when we were watching a Tamil movie with her, we knew all the insults from the yeah. movie and we'd laugh at them <laughs> yeah. because exactly. those were insults from our parents. And my grandmother was like, why are those the only words you know? Why are these the only words you've taught your children? But okay. that's the mistake you, you make when you learn French in college. When you learn French in college, you don't get to learn insults. Yeah, I didn't and get to I learn didn't. insults. I learned French growing up in Montreal as an Anglophone. I was in French immersion. And then my French was fine. You know, it was okay. But going there, living there, using it, and now lament, I mean, can, I can lament. Like, I lose it all the time. I read it all the time. I listen to it. I watch Lupin, you know, Lupin. Like I watched oh, so or, good. Saw the show about the um, you know, agents. Such a good show. Uh, Call so my watched, agent is so good. Yeah, it's so good. And so I take in as much of that French culture as I can. I turn, make sure the subtitles are turned off on Netflix or whatever. Like I do all of that. But it's it's not the same as really like being there, living there, picking up the paper, like doing whatever, like being there every day. I miss that so much. And I was supposed yeah. to go this year, like so many people. And of course. You know, I'm connected to people in France, but it's not the same as, yeah. as, as being I think there. That, that's something oftentimes I, I think we tell, or at least I, I think we often tell our students is like when they're contemplating like study abroad or those experiences, like if they have the financial means to do so, um, or they find opportunities in which they can they can kind of make it work is it, there's, there's something really intangible about that experience is like you will you will be a different person when you come back and it will only be better. Like it's just just being able to do that, I think it is, is incredibly important and, and trying to convey that to, you know, a 20 year old or something like that, I think is, is, is incredibly hard, yeah. you know, and that's that's why these like these, these stories that humanize it are so important. Sorry, go ahead. I, no, I was just going to say, I don't know if either one of you have had this experience. I'm sure you have, but like I've had that experience teaching over the years French history, whether it's a survey or other more focused seminars or whatever, where then a student will go and I mean, in like, they'll come back and tell me a story, which is wonderful. Or well, sometimes they'll send me a postcard and it'll be like, you know how you said that? Cause I will say like, like Barsha said earlier, it's like history's everywhere. It's on the public transportation. It's yeah. every street you're on, every name, every monument. And there are monuments like you cannot breathe without painting a monument in Paris, let's say, but other French cities as well. And then they'll go and they'll be like, oh my goodness, like I experienced that sense of a place where the history is constantly at stake. It's constantly being referenced. And it's here too, where I live, where both of you live, I'm sure, but yeah. there it's like in your face all the time. And then they tell me that they felt it. And that's so satisfying when they get to see what I mean and why that matters and connect it to things back here. Like it's invaluable and I didn't do it in high school and I didn't do it in college, but I'm so glad I got to do it in graduate school. And in the end, I was very slow and I still am, I'm still working on the second book. Like it took me a very long time to finish my dissertation. This is not uh, an endorsement of anything, Varsha, and it's not like a <laughs> of anything. I'm taking notes, I'm People taking notes. Should. I was very lucky. I could stay. I stayed for, I went for nine months and I stayed for three years because I fell in love with this dude. And 
and uh, it didn't work out. Um, it's still nice, but it didn't work out. Um, and I am so glad at the time I was all stressed because I should finish my dissertation and hurry up and I will never get to do it. I might get to, I mean, my kid, when my kid's older, I might get to go back for a year again. I haven't done that in over like 25 years, but I, I will never get to do it like that. Like without the, with, I had responsibilities, but different ones. I was, well, I was in my twenties, which was so rad. I will never get to be like a student in France for three years. And so it was kind of funny because I was so self-conscious about being slow at the time. And now I'm like, thank goodness I'd spent that time there because it connected me to this place in a way that will never go away. I'll always love it at the same time that I kind of hate it and complain about it. And I'm like, every once in a while, I'm like, maybe I should rename this survey class France. What a bunch of mofos. Like, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> that is a quote. That should be the title of the episode. <laughs> Yeah, I will say, so my one experience researching abroad, so I have been able to spend like two summers researching in DC. And obviously people will be like, Varsha, that's not the same, that's still America. But it, I did feel historical in, in there because I got to go to, if you go to DC, obviously the first thing you do if you're a nerd like me is you go see the constitution. And like, I remember telling my American history professor this, one of my advisors in grad school, uh, this, that I was like, the first thing I did was like, I went to see the constitution. It was my first time in DC. He's like, it's just a piece of paper, Varsha. And I was like, but you're an early Americanist. Have you never seen the constitution? He's like, no, I've read it in a book though. And I was like, what? Um, so, but, when I got to go for my undergraduate um, honors thesis, I uh, I came up with a topic, right? And I, I go, walk up to my British history professor at the time and I was like, hey, um, I might wanna write my thesis on this like a year early. Uh, do I have to go to England for this? And he's like, yes. And I was like, oh damn, I need to get a visa. <laughs> I find, I cause I had a green card back then. I figure out a way to get there. I find people to stay with. So I don't have to like, you know, uh, rent a sketchy apartment. And it's like, the best three weeks of my life. One, it's January in London. So there is no sun anywhere. People don't know this about me. I hate the sun. Like, I love the fact that it was always foggy. It was like, there was no Marcia, sun. you're in Berkeley. Always... There's nothing but sun. What are you I doing? I know. I hate it. I've been here eight years. Get me out of Do here. Um, Do a swap. You can come here and live in my sad gray apartment. <laughs> <laughs> but the best thing is the days that I was not in the archive, because the archive itself, you know, you walk in, either it's the National Library or the British Library or the National Archives of the British Library, and you're just like, whoa, history, like, whoa, right? But then the days you're not in the archive, you're just walking the streets of London, and shit is just old. And you're like, I've never seen stuff yeah. this old before. Yeah. It's so yeah. cool. It's true. It's true. Now that I live in Vancouver, where like people are like, oh my God, is that mid-century? Like, <laughs> 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 and like, if something gets like a little bit of dirt on it, they're like, that needs to be renovated. We got to replace that shit. Like then I did this thing, the last time I was in France, I just started taking pictures of the apartment building doors and the doorways and the like, there's the code to get it in, in and the digit, you know, all the stuff. But just, the, I was like, this door has just been there forever. It's cruddy. It's been painted a couple of times. Sometimes like it doesn't open properly. You can't quite figure out how the latches, but like they are not going to replace it with like a sliding glass door or whatever. And there's super modern and modernist things in Paris too. That's for sure. Some cool, like the pharmacies. I was like, when I took my son there, he's really into Star Wars. So he'd be like, I'm using the force. And I'm opening the first <laughs> door. Like, he loves it. And so there's that mix of things, but yeah, things that are just old, and they're just all, they're just gonna stay that way and they're cruddy. And that's also true of where I'm from, Montreal. And it's certainly true of New York and other places, but here it's like, everything's pristine, everything's new, everything's glass and concrete. And I like it, but it's not the same. Yeah. There's something about being in a place, right? Like, and I think that's, 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 that's kind of some of the, the allure of history. Like, and it can be used like in really kind of terrible ways like about that, that kind of connection to the past that people feel by being in, in the place or touching the object, like you were saying, Barsha, like seeing the constitution. Like for me, like when I was in France, like, like touching the stone of um, Saint-Germain-de-Prés, right? Like there, there was something like just, just stunning about kind of the rough hewn stone of that to me the first time I did that. And I'll never kind of forget that. But, um, but yeah, but it's, it's, 
it's it's not just being like I think people sometimes think like being a historian is 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 kind of all intellectual like like you're a nerd who loves books and there's certainly an absolutely an element to that right like totally. but it's yeah. also like it's just you, you understand the importance of these these things and and what they mean to people by 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 living in different places and seeing different people interact with them. Absolutely. Is it weird that I felt that way when I saw a random dam in Northern California a few months ago? Because yes. like that's that's. I mean, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're the that's... dam lady. Like that's exactly. that's perfect. I think um, of dams when I, I I think of you when I see dams. Actually, that's so nice. Thank I you. Really it feels great. I saw a dam the other day, and I was like, should I send a picture of this to Varsha? <laughs> She like all dams? Like, is she annoyed? Yeah. She like, because no, no, no. Happens to me is like, people don't send me enough. People don't send me enough. There's a lot of time where, like, for, when you do French history, sometimes people will like buy you French things or French like objects. Just random stuff with French flags on it. A poster or blue, or white, white, and red things. Yeah. And so I was like, maybe Varsha is at that point where she's like, I don't need any more dam photos and dam. <laughs> cards. And, like, I'm at a dam, Varsha. Like, I just, I wasn't sure yeah. where you were at with that. No, yes. people should definitely say that. But okay, last question, and then I, I promise Matt will wrap up. But when you uh, learn about French history in high school, uh, if your European history teacher is lazy, she will show you Les Mis, right? My question is- Damn, uh, you can't talk about Les Mis. No, 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 I'm not asking you about Les Mis because okay. like, I love that movie, I love that musical. But like, what is your favorite French history movie, either fictional okay. or non-fictional or whatever to show to your students? Because I remember watching one in, in college about Algeria. And I remember, I forget the name. It's like a huge deal, but I forget what it's called. Battle of Algiers. That's, that's obviously, that's <laughs> the one. yes. So yes. that would be <laughs> one of them. It's definitely a favorite that I show. Um, uh, but, but honestly, uh, my favorite film to show my students is Lion, so Hate from 1995. Cause that's my, moment. Um, it came out the year before I went to France. The dude who I was mentioning, like, <laughs> the day I talk, Is he in the movie? No, oh, but, but I actually, he knows that I know, I met one of the people who's in the movie because he, the guy, the guy, anyway, whatever. And you don't need to know <laughs> the life story, but the guy I dated was a filmmaker and now he's an agent. <laughs> like, and call my agent. Okay, I know, he's an show. agent now. And yeah, like I met one of the extras, like guys on the rooftop in one of the scenes in the film and a couple of the people from the film. And um, it's my era. And it's how I, when the first time I saw Lion, I didn't understand anything. I watched it on a tiny little video, like movie with a, like a, uh, sorry, a TV with a VCR built in. <laughs> and I was like, what are they saying? Now, when I watch it, it's totally familiar to me. I've seen it a hundred times at least. I show it every year in my class. I don't think that film gets old. It is my favorite film to show um, to show my class for sure. And it's one of my favorite films to watch. I could watch it anytime. Like it, it's old and there are some 90s references and there's some very French references that people wouldn't get if they're from outside of France, but my students love it. They learn so much and they're like, when is this from? Because the rap and the music and stuff, like they don't know that it's out of date. Yeah. And it's like about, you know, race and um, like poverty and like violence and like all of these things that, yeah, it's about police violence. Like it makes sense in 2021, sadly, in France, here where I live, where you both live, I'm sure. Like, so yeah. it, it never gets old, that film for me. Yeah. So. Okay. All right, I, th I think on that note, everybody go watch Lynn and also a uh, Battle of Algiers. Everybody should watch that if they haven't watched that already. So um, uh, thank you so much, Roxanne, for, for joining us. This has been an absolutely wonderful and lovely conversation. Um, thank you everybody for, for tuning in and, and spending your Friday evening or afternoon or wherever you are kind of with us. Um, and we'll be back in two weeks. Um, I think our guest is uh, Peter Schulman and also we'll be talking about kind of environmental history in, in America and the United States and stuff like that. Uh, stay tuned for more on that. But until then, thank you again, Roxanne, on behalf of Varsha and Rachel and I, who's behind the scenes. Thanks, Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Thanks again, Roxanne.